Now, don't you hate it when the weatherman gets it wrong? And if you thought he had a tough task, well, what if the job to predict weather goes now into space? The UK's National Weather Service, the Met Office, is launching a space weather centre to do just that. This will allow us to be warned about potentially damaging events before they reach Earth. Like, for example, the effects of eruptions on the sun that uh, take days to actually reach Earth but carry magnetic power to knock out power grids when they arrive here. Well, our science correspondent Jonathan Amos has more. We live next to a colossal nuclear engine. Our star's energy sustains all life on Earth. It can also present us with some problems. The sun is constantly throwing radiation and particles in our direction. The mild effects are quite beautiful. The northern and southern lights are generated in these more gentle storms. But it's the really big outbursts that most concern scientists. Storms that have occurred in centuries past pose a greater threat to us now because we're so dependent on technology. These bigger events have the ability to disrupt the electronics in satellites, degrading our ability to forecast the weather and send communications around the world. Your ability to send emails, use credit cards or even trade on the stock market could become very difficult. A large solar flare could induce huge currents in power grids, leading to electricity outages that last weeks or even months. In the worst storms, aircraft might even have to be grounded because of glitches in their avionics and because of degraded radio communications. The keys to resilience, say experts, are the ability to forecast storms before they hit and to build in the necessary contingencies so that if systems go down, they can be brought back online as quickly as possible. Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Well, it's fascinating. What are the chances of solar flares impacting your world? Let's get more on this with a couple of experts who join me here on Global, because here with me is Dr Sheila Kanani, a planetary scientist with the Royal Astronomical Society, and from our own BBC Weather, which is run by the Met Office we were talking about, Darren Pett. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, Sheila, to you, first of all. I mean, you must be tremendously excited by this venture. <laughs> It's quite an interesting venture. I'm sort of imagining a, a weather forecast with the sun behind it going, you know, tremendous outbreaks today, bring your wellies, bring your hat kind of thing. But it's, it's, it's very forward thinking, so it's very exciting. So, I mean, space weather, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Why don't you just explain what are the sorts of things that you'd be looking out for here? OK, so space weather is basically anything that happens between the sun and the Earth and the other planets as well. But the sun's always outpouring the solar wind, which is a mass of charged particles and energy. And as it impacts the Earth's magnetic field, it can create all sorts of effects and it can have lasting effects on the Earth as well. Darren, in terms of the Met Office, this is a new venture. Why are they doing it, first of all? Well, the first thing I should say is this space weather centre is not going to be in space. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> it's not going to be in space. Um, back in 2011, um, solar storms were put on the National Risk Register and they were classified as a threat to the United Kingdom. And with government funding, the Met Office have been forecasting 24-7 uh, solar weather uh, since uh, April. Um, and if you think about it, you know, there's all those satellites around the Earth. We rely on them for the communications, GPS, etc. And we've seen what happens already when you have a solar storm, the aurora, for example. And in a worst case scenario, if you have uh, a coronal mass ejection, the, the matter from that could induce a current which could seriously affect our power, which is why the Met Office are working closely already with the National Grid. T tell me a little more about how you're getting the data, who else the Met Office are actually working with to put all of this together? Well, it's a new science, it's a, it's a developing science. That's important to say that. We're, the Met Office are working very closely with the British Geological Survey, uh, various universities around the country, and more importantly, working with NOAA in the United States to be uh, world leaders, world experts, if you like, in solar weather. Uh, Sheila, just in terms of the space weather, what is happening in space and importing it to what is happening on Earth, you know, brollies, wellies, gloves, I mean, how does that all work? Well, it's, it's obviously not uh, brollies and wellies and things, um, but what's important for the public and sort of 
for Earth is knowing when these CMEs that you talked about, all the solar flares are, are going to hit. Um, solar flares are massive injections of energy and CMEs are magnetic field and solar wind particles and they can knock out power grids and they have done in the past. Like In the 80s, I think Quebec was knocked out for nine hours and that's massive amounts of, of el uh, electricity and obviously the human impact, the cost involved and being able to overcome that in the future. We need to know when it's going to happen. I mean, that is, that Quebec incident is cited so is, I think, experiences for, for the Apollo astronauts a, a couple of times, and you can explain that. But, I mean, they are quite rare, are they not? They are quite rare, Direct yeah. impact? I guess they are, yes. Um, you know, we, we know of them happening in, in our lifetimes, but um, being able to know when they're going to occur, it can save lives, for example, for astronauts. Darren, I mean, there is endless fascination with weather. I suppose the jury's out about whether people will be really interested on space weather. Oh, I don't know. It's something new and exciting, isn't it? Um, but it, it, it is a challenge. It is a new science. And um, if you think of where we were in terms of how we forecast the weather on Earth 30 years ago, we're sort of starting at that level, if you like. So we, we rely on observations, of which there aren't many in space, and we rely on computer models. So this is all basic at the moment, so it will be a huge challenge. It has all the potential for go. a space age Michael Fish, doesn't it? Uh, Getting it wrong. Because yes. it's, always, it's always tough. I mean, it's tough with normal weather. Can, and this is what, like 50, 60 yeah. years ago, yeah. I suppose, the equivalent. Yeah. It, it, for a while, it is going to be extremely difficult. But we, obviously, we need to learn more. We will learn more. Technology will advance and we will improve in terms of our forecasting, as we have done over the last 30 years, despite your opening comment. <laughs> <laughs> there is only, Sheila, so much you can actually measure, isn't there? I mean, these are quite difficult things to try to, to actually learn from. What are you hoping to learn from all of this, do you think? I think just the more we learn about CMEs particularly, at the moment we can't really ever measure solar flares. We know when they're happening, we can see when they're happening, but they get to the Earth so quickly, it only takes eight minutes for a solar flare, so the energy from the sun to get to the Earth, they're, they're too quick. But if we can plan or sort of see in the future when the CMEs are going to hit the Earth, we can sort of batten down the hatches and make sure astronauts are protected and protect our sort of power networks and our GPS satellites and and those sorts of things so I think you know we're living in such a technology age it's important and I mean I was teasing Darren about <laughs> getting it wrong but I mean people have been looking at the Sun for, for centuries yes. in terms of accuracy all, all of this new data how much of a leap forward potentially could it be well, massive. I mean, we've only really been ha uh, collecting data from this area since the 1950s, and we've made such a massive leap in those years that if you think about 100 years' time, who knows what we might know. All right, uh, Dr. Sheila Kanani and Darren Bett, thanks to both of you for explaining all those things about uh, space weather. Thanks very much to both of you. Here's what uh, is ahead next on Global after the break. Well, US-led airstrikes on Kobani but are they making any impact whatsoever? We'll have the latest on the ground. Plus, what does it take to win a Nobel Prize for Physics? We'll be shedding some light on that for all of you. That's all coming up here on Global in the next couple of minutes. Do stay with us.